Well, amen. It's an old saying uh, that I'd like to say. I feel like I've been to church. I don't know about you, but that's what I feel like. What a wonderful, uh, wonderful time of worshiping our Lord together. Now, I want to begin uh, this morning by inviting you back to a very unique, very special service uh, this evening on our Olive Drive campus at 530. We're having what we call an ordination service. There's two young men in our church, Jared White and Patrick Gomez, who were ordaining to gospel ministry. Uh, my dad will preach the message, and really, historically, it's called a charge. It's really the message is to these two guys tonight uh, about being a pastor and uh, ordained in ministry. Uh, and then uh, those of us who are ordained ministers will lay on hands while all the congregation is praying as well. We'll have extended time of, uh, of prayer for them. And so if you've never been to ordination service, uh, you, you want to come tonight. You want to experience it. And if you have, I'm sure you won't want to miss it tonight at 530. And then uh, I just want to say another quick word. I've got a stool up here I may need to use. Uh, my back's giving me trouble. Last a week ago Saturday, I took a real hard fall and uh, was... Uh, Felt like I was crippled there for a couple days, but I'm, I'm getting around now doing much better. God is providing healing and quick recovery, but uh, my back is just like a knot. So uh, we'll see if I need that. Let's go ahead and open our Bible to Revelation chapter 2. Uh, we'll look at verses 12 through 17 in a message I've entitled, In the World and of the World. Chapter 2, uh, Verses 12 through 17. Now in John chapter 17, the night before Jesus was crucified, he's praying to the Father for his disciples, and he basically prays that they would be in the world, but they wouldn't be of the world. Meaning, I want you to remain, he's praying for you and I as disciples, remain in the world, but I don't want you to be like the world. You see, when Jesus touches your life, he changes you. He gives you spiritual life, there's, there's new birth, and then he takes you on this journey of transformation, transforming us by his word. In that same chapter, chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus prays, sanctify them. He's talking to the Father. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Romans chapter uh, 12, verse number 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. So when we encounter Jesus by faith, he gives us new life, and then he begins changing us from the inside out. Our mind is renewed by his word, and as it's renewed, his spirit renews our hearts. Now, when we come to the church of Pergamos, or Pergamum, as sometimes it's called, we're going to see a great church that was beginning to drift the wrong direction in their journey of transformation. They were going the wrong way. Some of them were in the world, and they were also of the world. Jesus begins his letter in verse number 12. He writes, and to the angel, that's the messenger or pastor, the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things says he who has a sharp two-edged sword. Now, notice Jesus begins his letter. He doesn't begin it with the, the warm fuzzies, does he? He begins by reminding all of us that he carries with him a sword that he also is the judge, and it's the Word of God. But then he quickly moves on to commending this church for their faith in him. Look at verse number 13. Jesus says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. And we come across that language, where, what does that mean where Satan throne is, Satan's throne is? What does it mean where Satan dwells? I think a little background on the city will be helpful. Pergamus had a great political and religious significance to the Roman Empire. It was a center of worship for all the Greco-Roman gods with a number of different temples, with the most famous and prominent being the massive temple that was built for Zeus. An altar was built there. In fact, the altar of Zeus is considered considered uh, to be one of the ancient wonders of the world. It was a throne for the god of Zeus that was 116 feet wide by 109 feet deep. 
But the Greek gods weren't the only ones that were worshipped in Pergamos. We know that also it was the first city in Asia Minor that built a temple to the emperor for worship. Everyone was forced in that city to declare Caesar is Lord, which created quite a trouble for the church, for the Christians. Now, the point is clear of what this means. Satan had a stronghold on this city. Now, we need to recognize Satan's not omnipresent, is he? Uh, He's not everywhere at once like God is. He's in one place at a time. But he has demons who roam the earth and do his bidding. But it appears at least from these verses, that Satan had set up his domain. His headquarters were in Pergamos, and the city had embraced satanic worship in one form or another. Now, Jesus commends the church for holding fast to his name in the midst of Satan's reign. Now, here's the principle. A church's presence in an evil culture is to be commended. I can't think of a better place for a church to be than in the headquarters of Satan. Because as the culture and the world grows darker and darker, the light of Jesus shines brighter and brighter, doesn't it? Now, while some will flee Satan's reign, some Christians stand their ground. In fact, some Christians as missionaries go go running into the darkness. Sometimes Christians will blame their lack of spiritual maturity uh, on outside circumstances, you know. I, if I didn't live in California, I'd be a, a better Christian. If I wasn't married to this person, I would be a better Christian. Or if I didn't work in this office or that office or out in the oil fields, I would be a better Christian. The church of Pergamos was located where Satan had set up his headquarters. And they weren't making excuses, and Jesus commends them. He commends them first for holding fast, he says, to my name. There's something powerful about the name of Jesus, isn't there? I mean, it is powerful. Now, it's not magical. Uh, It only has power as it's connected to the real person of Jesus in faith, right? Right? In Acts chapter 19, we come across some Jewish exorcists who had noticed that demons were fleeing at the name of Jesus. And so they thought, you know, we we could use this. And so they tried to use Jesus' name to drive out a demon, and the demon talks back to them. We see uh, see it in Acts chapter 19, verse number 15. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? The demon knew there there was no power with them saying it magically because it was not connected to them knowing Jesus and and, and faith. Jesus' name is not something to be manipulated. So when the church, when Jesus rather commends the church for holding fast to my name, what he's saying is you've held fast to me. So there's power in the name of Jesus, but we also know there's salvation in the name of Jesus, isn't there? Um, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, which by we must be saved. There's salvation in the name of Jesus. There's authority in the name of Jesus. There's so much authority in the name of Christ that when Peter and John were arrested in chapter 4 of Acts, they stood before the Sanhedrin, the, the ruling priest of the day, and they were commanded by them in verse number 18. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in what? The name of Jesus. Now, why would they, why would they say that? <laughs> they had realized and noticed there was something uniquely powerful about Christ's name. Now, the church of Pergamos, they knew Jesus and they held tightly to his name. But what we're going to find out is that fact cost them dearly. Because while there's power in the name of Jesus, there's also persecution in the name of Jesus. It says, Jesus says, and you didn't deny my faith. And he spells it out, in the days of Antipas, my faithful martyr who was killed among you. Jesus said, you didn't deny me even when it cost you greatly, even when you faced death because of it. Did you realize that for the believer, there's both the power, there's both power in the name of Jesus, but there's also persecution. If a politician gets up and they start talking about their faith in God, most of the time, people will ooh and awe about, uh, about that. That's a positive thing for their image. But they stand up, and they start personalizing, talking about the name of Jesus. You better watch out. The swords come out, right? 
I've been asked to speak on several occasions at high school baccalaureates uh, that is traditionally was a Christian ceremony for graduating se seniors. Through the years, I've spoken at a number of them. Uh, over time, it's, a lot of them have devolved into something less than Christian. On one occasion, I showed up to speak that evening, and I had my Bible in my hand, and an adult who was part of uh, helping run the thing, who I didn't know, by the way, uh, one of the teenagers had recommended me to speak, he, he met me, and he kind of gave me some instructions. He said, you know, this, is, this ceremony is going to be a little more inclusive, a more inclusive service, so it would be helpful if you didn't talk too much and mention too much the name of Jesus. And I just, I told him, I, I'm sorry, but I, I, I can't speak then. I'm not your guy. I'm, I, I'm here to speak about Jesus. I cannot help but speak of his name. Now, a little bit shocked, he said, okay, I don't think he had a backup speaker lined up. Um, and so I spoke. And you know what I did? I preached the name and the person and the work of Jesus Christ, the salvation and the power and the authority that's in it. Now, here's my point. My point is Jesus is the divider. We live in a culture that doesn't mind us speaking about God, mentioning God. But we mention Jesus, we better watch out, we better watch our back. That's what it was like in Pergamos. The gods were in. Religion was in. Oh, they, oh, religion is in. Jesus was out. But the Christians there, they didn't shy away from speaking his name. They held fast to his name. They would not deny him. Now, Jesus refers to one of their members that were among them, a, a person by the name of Antipas, who did not deny the faith. So he died. He was killed as a faithful martyr. He chose death rather than to deny his Savior. It reminds me of Cassie Bernal. On April 20th, 1999, two students went into Columbine High School on a shooting rampage, and 12 students and one teacher were killed. One of those students was Cassie Bernal. Just before she was killed with a gun to her, she was asked, do you believe in God? And Cassie, we know her story, was a Christ follower. And she said, yes. And at that moment, she was shot and she was killed. Cassie's faith is to be commended. Here's the first principle. A church's commitment to Christ in the face of persecution is to be commended. Some of our sister churches around the world that are in the body of Christ, they're suffering. Our brothers and sisters are suffering. We should pray for them earnestly and we should commend them. Some think about Cassie, though. They're giving her life because she simply said the word yes instead of the word no. And they start thinking, well, was it worth it? Did it really matter whether she said the word yes or no? Wouldn't God understand? Wouldn't, wouldn't it have been better? She could have lived a long life as a witness for him. Did, did it really matter? And I'm, I'm here to say, yes, it mattered. Yes, it was worth it. She honored God with her last words. And, and now I am here, 23 years later, talking about her witness to Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. Pergamos was to be commended for their bold and courageous and faith-filled church. But sadly, we're going to find as we keep reading, it's not the end of the story. While they were bold in their faith in one sense, they were weak in being compromised from within. They were compromising with Satan's world that was around them. Now remember, Satan had set up some headquarters there. This was a city that he, he reigned, where government was no longer a restraint uh, to Satan, but it was an agent of Satan. And so they stood strong against the sword, but they, and they held tightly to Jesus. But the Bible says that Satan is the most cunning and crafty and, and deceiving creatures of all. And so he devised a plan to take down the church of Pergamos, not by the sword, but by compromise. Let's look at verse number 14. He says, but I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold to the doctrine or the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I also hate. 
Now, what in the world is Jesus referring to here? Let's, let's start first with the lesser known Nicolaitans. This is the second time Jesus refers to them in his seven letters. But unlike their mentioned in Ephesus, who hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, the Paragamos uh, church, they were tolerant of their, their teaching. Now, little is known of the Nicolaitans. Some have suggested they came from the followers of Nicholas, who was one of the original deacons in Acts chapter 6, that, that Nicholas, the, the followers of him, spun off into Gnosticism. The Gnostics are a, a really difficult group to get our, our heads around. Gnostic simply comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means having knowledge. The Gnostics highlighted the spiritual world to the demonization of the physical. They emphasized this personal spiritual knowledge above orthodox teaching of Scripture in the church. They, they were considered antinomians. We're going to come more to antinomians later with the, the, the Balaam thing. Now, the other prominent understanding of the Nicolaitans comes from their name. The first part of their name is Nike, which means victory. The second part is Laos, which means people. We get the word laity from it. So there's victory or rulership over the people, over the laity. Some scholars believe that the Nicolaitans first introduced the hierarchical system that eventually led to the priestly system of the Roman Catholic Church, the haves and the have-nots spiritually, that those with the special uh, knowledge and access to God were superior in a different category than the common people, the common laity. They used that special knowledge to rule over the common people. Jesus says, I hate that kind of thinking. To Ephesus, he said, I hate even their deeds. Now, for centuries, if you look at history, Baptists have been on the front lines against that sort of thinking with an emphasis on what's called the priesthood of the believers and church membership. That the Bible believes all believers are equally significant members in the body of Christ. We're all priests under the great high priest, which means every one of us has direct access to God. There's no caste system in the church and we should, we should fight against any system that separates clergy from the laity, from the people. We all have access to God. Now, what about this reference to Balaam? That might escape you. It's, to understand it, we've got to go back in our Old Testament. Uh, the story of Balak and Balaam is found in Numbers chapter 22 through 25. Balak, and don't get the names confused, it's easy to do. I might even do it uh, here this morning. I think I did it at 8 o'clock. Balak was the king of the Moabites, and he felt threatened by the nearby 2 million-ish Jews, Israelites, that were wandering around the deserts. You see, the neighboring Amorites had attacked the Israelites, and the Israelites, by the hand of God, defeated them and then took over their cities. Balak saw what they did to the Amorites, and he starts shaking in their boots that, that the Moabites are next. So Balak went and hired Balaam, a nearby witch doctor of sorts, to pronounce a curse, to prophesy a curse upon the Israelites. He was paid to prophecy. I guess you could say he was a for-profit prophet. A little wordplay there. This is not a good thing. In a very fascinating story, Balaam told Balak that he only could declare the words of God. That, that part was good. And so, Balak tried to get him to curse the Israelites, but out comes blessing. Several times he blesses the Israelites. Balak's a little upside, uh, upset by that. But according to Numbers chapter 31, Balaam, who was greedy for the gold and the money that had been offered to him, devised a plan to go around Balak's plan to take down the Israelites. He basically told Balak, if, you, if you'll read there, instead of defeating the Israelites by a curse or by the sword, Instead, as the king, you should send all the young, beautiful Moabite women to seduce the men of Israel. Balaam's theory was that if, if the Israelites started sleeping around in sexual immorality, those women would have influence on them to pull them away from Yahweh God into worship of the false gods, and that, that God would judge Israel because of it. It's actually exactly what happened. Numbers chapter 25, verse number 1. Now, Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. 
So uh, they invited the people. Uh, they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal or Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. God went on to judge the Israelites as Balaam had thought he would do. And 24,000 men who had been sleeping around with the Moabite women and worshiping their false gods, God killed in judgment. Now that story is the backdrop of Jesus' words to the church of Pergamos. Jesus is saying, you've begun following the teaching of Balaam. And you're playing the harlot with the enemy, engaging in sexual immorality and engaging in, in sacrifices to other gods. Now, Satan couldn't take them down with the sword. He tried, but they withstood and they were even killed. So he instead uses the same tactic that he used with Balaam and the Israelites. He throws sexual temptation their way and they fall for it. Evidently, some in the church had allowed sexual sin into their, their life. They allowed sexual sin into their camp. And it was just the compromise. It was the crack in the door that Satan needed to get them away from the relationship with God and start looking at other gods. You see, compromise with the world always leads to more compromise with the world. Now, if you don't think that Satan and his minions aren't trying to take down the church of God, Jesus' church, then you're fooling yourself. Now, for the most part, the Western church has been protected, and we should th be thankful to God. We've been protected from uh, persecution and the threat of death for the most part, which means I believe Satan has worked overtime in getting us to compromise. And it could be, it just might be that sexual sin, sin is still the number one stumbling block that he has put in front of the church. Sexual temptation is so rampant, it's so pervasive in our culture, and some in the church, some of Jesus' blood-bought children are playing the harlot with the world. They, they've fallen right into Satan's trap that he set. And whatever compromise is made at that level, it leads to more drifting and more compromise. Maybe it's one curious look at pornography. Then it's a lingering look at pornography. Then it's an addictive look at pornography. Maybe it starts with a little innocent flirting in the office if there was such a thing. And then it moves to full-fledged adultery and sexual promiscuity. Now, here's the most painful thing about sexual sin and compromise with the world for the believer, for the individual. It, it severs the intimacy of relationship that Jesus offers us. The fellowship is interrupted. Instead of this sweet, sweet fellowship of love and joy and peace that Jesus offers us in relationship, believers, because of compromise, they start experiencing a guilt-ridden relationship with God. And it is hard to pull out of that. You can by confessing. We'll talk about that here in a, here in a little bit. But, but you've lost the, the sweetness that God has offered us. The church at Pergamos, they apparently had some teachers who we now would call antinomian. Nomian means law. They were anti-law. They were taking the truthful teachings of the gospel. That we're not saved by the keeping of the law. We're only saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. They were taking that legitimate truth and they were twisting it. They were twisting it to mean that not only are we not saved by the law, but the law has zero bearing on us as Christians, even after we're saved. That the commands of God are useless and powerless and impotent. Paul dealt with that antinomians in Romans. Romans chapter 6, beginning of verse 15. I want you to follow his logic. He says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present your bodies slaves to obey? You're that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and you have been set free from sin and have become what? slaves of righteousness. Paul's saying, as Christians under gra grace, we are bound, we are enslaved, we are bound 
to live more righteous than anyone would under the law. That our driving motivation, though, is not the law and its condemnation. Our driving motivation is the grace of, and the love and the forgiveness of God. But, but righteousness is not at stake here. Motivation's at stake. The antinomian, Balaam-like people in Pergamos had let the devil into their church, and it appears they may have been blaming the grace of God on it as their excuse. Now, I've shared with you in the past, but when I was a college pastor here at Valley, there was a young man in our group who uh, seemed uh, t- uh, to love our Lord. He, he had influence in the group. He was a leader type uh, of a man. And uh, I learned that he was uh, openly sleeping with his girlfriend. And so I talked with him about it. And I learned that it wasn't just, you know, some kind of uh, foolish slip up. It was a repeated lifestyle. So I, as I was talking with him about this, he told me these words. He said, I know it's not right, but I'm waiting on God to do some work on me to give me the desire and the ability to not have sex with her. I was dumbfounded. I was speechless for a moment. Then I spoke. He was a classic antinomian doctrine of Balaam following God-blaming harlot and idolater right in front of my nose and my leadership. Now, needless to say, I refused to let him continue to introduce the doctrine of Balaam in our group, and, and he left. And this is not a guy that misunderstood. Well, he did misunderstand the grace of God. He knew it was by God's love and by God's grace. He was twisting it. He was abusing it. So while the church of Pergamos, they were bold in their faith, and that sh- we should commend them for that, but we need to learn from them. They were compromising. They were looking just like everyone else around them. But Jesus offered to pull them out of it, just like he offers to pull us out of it if, if you're in that spot. In verse number 16, Jesus gives the most beautiful invitation. He begins with the word, repent. He invites us back to him. Repent means to turn or to to change directions. It's a change of mind that leads to a change of behavior. It's a spiritual decision, much like faith is. It's the flip side of the same coin of faith. To to decide to turn from one's current state of sin in oneself and turn and stay to embrace Jesus by faith. Maybe you need that offer of God's forgiveness. Maybe you're compromising with the world. Jesus is saying, turn back to me. Here's the principle. God offers forgiveness to any of us who have drifted into worldliness. Maybe you're like the believers of uh, Pergamos. You're in the world, and unfortunately, you're of the world. I'm not talking about the, you know, traditional stuff, not having drums in the, the, the worship service type worldliness. I'm talking about real spiritual stuff. That there's no distinction in your life between someone who's met Jesus and someone who hasn't met Jesus. That you've bought somehow into the world systems of thinking and behaving. That if, that if you were put on trial for being a Christian, there wouldn't be enough evidence to convict you. That somewhere along the way, you departed from your walk with God and you made friends with the devil instead. That perhaps maybe you've played the harlot and you, you've fallen for the enemy's schemes and lies to take you down. That is worldliness. Jesus said, I want you to be in the world. I don't want you to be of the world. Jesus said, come back to me. I offer forgiveness. I offer life, healing, restoration. I offer my presence. Repent. Come back to me. But that's not all Jesus said, is it? Look at verse number 16. He gives us a warning. He says, repent or else I will come to you quickly or suddenly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Here's the principle. A church's continued worldliness will bring the sword of Jesus. Any church, any local expression of the body of Christ who continues with compromise will face Jesus' judgment. Now, remember, Jesus begins his letter by saying, 
The one who's writing is the one who holds the sharp two-edged sword. Remember from chapter 1, this image of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, who has a sword coming out of his mouth? The sword represents the judgment of God, but it also represents the Word of God, doesn't it? In Ephesians chapter 6, the the Word of God is called the sword of the Spirit. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse number uh, 12. For the Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of the soul and the spirit, and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there's no creature hidden from his, that's Jesus, sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. See, the Word of God is an amazing thing. It's alive, it's active, and it's a sharp sword. And what it does is it pierces into the heart. And it's it's a beautiful thing because as it pierces our heart and we respond with, with faith and repentance... We experience the love and the grace of God. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. But the sword can begin piercing one's heart, the Word of God. And someone can harden. They can say no. And as the sword pierces and you harden, eventually, someday, Jesus will use the same sword to judge you. You will be, will be judged by the Word of God. Now, notice he says, repent or else. <laughs> Isn't that what it says? Jesus says, repent or else. Did you realize it's that simple with God? It's that black and white? Sometimes people get confused and they think their relationship with God falls somewhere in between, but, but it doesn't. He says, come back to me or else. Now, Jesus ends his letter with a by giving a beautiful response, uh, or promise to those of us who continue. Verse number 17, he who has an ear, let me just ask, do you have your spiritual ears on? Do you have an ear? He who has an ear, he says, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone And on the stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Here's the principle. Jesus promises approval and intimacy to all who overcome by faith. It's a beautiful thing. Now, let me start first with the stone. He says he's going to give a white stone. There's going to be a name written on it. No one really knows it except for the person who receives it. What all does that mean? Unfortunately, there's about a dozen interpretations. It's hard to get our hand, heads around it exactly. Some believe this is a reference to athletes in the uh, first century Olympic Games who were given a stone, a stone of, a, 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 of participation. That some, some believe the unknown name is a new name, a new Christian name that we're given in heaven. Some think that the unknown name refers to the unknown name Jesus uh, has later in the book of Revelation. We don't know for sure, but this is what I do believe it means. This represents a token of Jesus' approval for all those who overcome by faith. That he, he approves us. He looks at us, sin and all, clothed in the righteousness of of Christ, white as snow in terms of forgiveness, and he approves of us. He receives us. Now, he also says that he's going to give hidden manna to eat. Manna was a honey-tasting bread that came from heaven in the Old Testament. The Israelites were wandering the desert. They didn't have any food to eat. And so supernaturally, God provided this manna from heaven. They'd wake up in the morning, they'd come out of their tents, and there'd be this manna, this bread, all over the ground. They didn't work for it. They didn't earn it. They simply received it, and it sustained their life. Now, what about this word hidden? He says, I'm going to give you hidden manna. I think this hidden manna is the manna that's referred to in Hebrews chapter 9. That was put, some manna was put in a golden pot, and then it was placed in the Ark of the Covenant. And that Ark of the Covenant was placed into the Holy of Holies, where no one saw it. It was hidden from everyone. Jesus says, Come to me, overcome by faith, you persevere, and I'm gonna give you some of that hidden manna. Now, in John chapter 6, Jesus taught us that he is the true manna from heaven. 
He's the bread of life. I believe he's the hidden manna. You see, Jesus offers us a taste of himself. The true manna of heaven. We don't work for it. Oh, we can't earn Jesus. We, we deserve judgment for Jesus. We can't possibly earn his favor. There's nothing that we can do to earn his favor. We don't work for him. We just open up our tent. We just wake up. We just, we just come and we receive it. We notice it. We believe and we receive it. The infinite resources of life. God doesn't just invite us in a relationship with him to the outer courts of the tabernacle or the temple. No, no, no. I think Jesus is saying here, I'm offering you into the holy of holies where no one else would go. Intimacy with Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I am a sucker for some freshly cooked hot bread. You know that bread's cooking in the oven and you start smelling it in the house and the mouth starts to water a little bit and they it comes out of the oven, it's sitting there, and you're just, you know, better not be on a diet when that spread shows up, right? Because it's incredibly enticing. It's hard to resist. Personally, depending on what kind of bread it is, I like to, some kinds of bread, I like to take some honey butter, and put it on that bread. Take in that bread and that sweet satisfaction that comes over me. Listen, Jesus is saying, I'm going to, I promise, I'm going to give you a taste. I'm going to give you some of the sweet manna, some of the sweet bread, and I am he. Jesus is the fresh bread. He's the honey-tasting bread of heaven, and he wants to give us a taste. All of us are hungry for it. Some people go to the junk, the junk to feel that satisfaction. He's saying, I'm right here. I'm the hidden manna. Now, I wish I could describe Jesus to you. The taste, to, to, I, he's indescribable. But here's the great news this morning. I don't have to fully describe him, describe him because I can't. Here's the great news. I don't have to because you can experience him. You can experience him. There's only one requirement that he gives us in this passage. Turn to me. Turn from that life you've been living that's got you all the mess that you have. Turn to me in faith. And then you'll taste the sweetness of Jesus.